Hello, this is Lee Darrell, my guest today. She's the honorary director of the Darrell Wildlife Conservation Trust that was set up by Gerald Darrell. The trust runs the famous Jersey Zoo as well as works on the conservation of extremely endangered species. In India, it supports the pygmy hog project that involves captive breeding and restocking the wild. Lee studied animal co communication for her PhD and she's also a writer and television producer, I'm sorry, presenter. Lee, welcome to the Wild Women interviews. Thank you very much. I'm very delighted to be here, Jeanette. What makes you happy, Lee? Makes me happy. Um, I'd say being, being right now, being with my animals. I've, I've only recently been adopted by a dog and a cat. I and, and, and they're just wonderful. And I just love being with them and playing with them. And that, that's my happy place now. Right. And what is your greatest fear? Greatest fear? Mm. I, you know, the sort of big picture fear that the, the world will not really wake up to all of the environmental issues facing us today. Well, to my mind, the absolute most important, biggest things we've got to think about, biodiversity loss, climate change and all that. You can kind of see the world edging towards properly thinking about those issues, but will we really do it? We as a species, are we capable of being wise enough and smart enough. And my fear, well, my fear is, I guess, I just don't know, don't know what will happen. What talent would you most like to, like to have? Oh, that's a good question. I, um, well, I love music. And I, when I was young, a youngster, I had guitar lessons and things like that. And, and I've had organ lessons recently, but I don't think I've, I'm not a real natural at it. I would love to be a natural musician and just be able to make, make music like many people can do. And it's just wonderful to watch. So I, I envy them that. Let's talk about Gerald Darrell. He had an India connection, didn't he? Well, he certainly did because he was born there. Um, he was born in Jamshedpur in 1925. His, his dad was the, was a, very well-known civil engineer. And when Jerry, a few years before Jerry was born and for about, I don't know, eight years, he worked for the Tata Steel and Iron Company, or Iron and Steel Company, I think we should, we should say. And he, so that's why he lived in Jamshedpur, but he did so many things for them. And I was lucky enough to visit India a few years ago and actually go to Jerry's birthplace. The bungalow where he was born is still part of the Tata complex, the Tata workers live there. Jerry's father built it and then put his family there. And I met the, the uh, family there uh, uh, four years ago and they knew all about Jerry and the father. Actually, Jerry's father was better known in Jamshedpur than Jerry himself because he built the, the big uh, administration block. He built a big hospital, which I toured. He just, he did so much for that that company and he's almost revered there anyway that is Jerry's those are Jerry's Indian roots in Jamshedpur he recalls um, incidents a few incidents in India and and one was with his ayah and his ayah took him for I think his ayah used to take him down to a little zoo somewhere nearby so he, he remembered that and he remembered watching little creepy crawlies with his ayah and just remembering the colors and sense of India and, you know, always talk with great fondness. But oddly enough, he didn't go back to India. He left when he was two years old and did not return in for more than 50 years. And I'll, maybe I'll get into that, that bit of the story a little bit later. But uh, as I say, Jerry le left India when he was two years old. They went back to, well, I shouldn't say back to because the family was, um, Jerry's mother and father were born in India but they had family connections or ties in uh, uh, Bournemouth, first in London, then down at Bournemouth. And um, went back to, the, to England uh, and lived there until Jerry was about 10 years old. He, uh, he was not a very good student. He hated school. It was just too, too restrictive. And um, anyway, he, he, but at that point, he, by the time he was 10, the whole family 
um, led by a brother Lawrence Durrell, who had also been born in India, became the famous author. And by this time, by when Jerry was 10, Larry, Larry was in his early 20s. And he urged the whole, or insisted, I should say, the whole family moved to the Greek island of Corfu. And that was something which changed Jerry's life dramatically. They, um, he, it was there that he, that Jerry discovered his great passion for animals, for the animal kingdom, his love of nature and his appreciation for science with the, the people that he was associating with. Uh, the whole family loved Corfu and it was just a, a wonderful idyll, really. Jerry made it famous in his famous book, My Family and Other Animals. And very recently, there's been a, a, a series of television programs about the Corfu period and the Durrells. It's called the Durrells. I don't know if it's, it's been in India or not. Have you, have you seen it, Janae? I haven't. It, it heard, I don't watch television, but I haven't heard any publicity around it. Okay. okay. Well, anyway, it's been very popular in the UK and in, in the States and, and such. And, and I'm really glad that it happened because it's kind of reawakened people to the Durrell name and Jerry's love of animals. And, and so I think it's been altogether a good thing. You are in Corfu now, right? Is that correct? I'm actually started with I'm, I'm actually speaking to you from the island of Corfu. Because what happened was just to fast forward a lot, um, I started coming to Corfu myself um, to sort of lead Gerald Darrell tours. And this was well, starting 10 years ago. And I just fell in love with the island. And so uh, very recently I actually bought a house here that will be, you know, a, a part-time home. But during the, the pandemic, I've been here for, for five months and I can't really see any point of leaving my little piece of paradise. <laughs> so are your dog and cat but the ones that give you the most happiness? They're with you in Corfu. They are, yes. Yeah, yeah. They, um, they, the, the puppy was abandoned uh, and I guess the cat was too. They just sort of arrived on the doorstep one day. Um, but that's what, that's what happens in Corfu. People um, abandon their animals and, you know, not everybody, but a lot of, it does happen a lot. And uh, so there's a, there's a big sort of animal rescue or several animal rescue centers. And, and so people try to look after them. We talked about Jerry's early life, but what about yours? Where your, what were your earliest aspirations? I know you always liked animals and you went on to study them, but did you really foresee running a zoo? <laughs> no, I didn't. I really, I, I probably, I mean, my, the path I was taking was studying. So I went to university and, and, um, Entered to graduate school and studied zoology there. So I was on an academic path, actually. But because I did my field research, my dissertation in animal communication in Madagascar, uh, I then went back to my university, which was American, Duke University in America. And uh, while what, what, what I was in Madagascar, I actually, well, I had a rather adventurous time and towards the end of my stay, uh, my little hut that I was staying was destroyed by a cyclone. And I had to go move in with the missionaries and, and started checking uh, Gerald Durrell books out of the mission library. I'd never read him before. So I was reading by sort of, you know, paraffin lamp, Gerald Durrell books. So then I get back to my university and lo and behold, my professor said, oh, have you ever heard of, uh, of a writer called Gerald Durrell? And I said, have I heard of him? He was my hero. I read all his books while I was in Madagascar, and you know, and uh, and they said, well, he's coming through to give a lecture, and we, since you had been to Madagascar and done something rather unusual for a young woman, would you like to um, come to dinner with the great man? I said, well, would I like to come to dinner? So, so I did. This is at one of my prof's houses, and. Uh, Jerry, Jerry walked into the room and whenever he walked into a room, you know, it just lit up a thousand watts. It was just his charisma and his presence was just extraordinary. So here I was, a young graduate student, a little bit overawed, you know, and I was sitting there and he made an absolute beeline for me. You know, I was the only young woman in the room. 
And so we just started talking and everything just kind of flowed from there. That was in 1977, I believe. Yeah, 77. And uh, and I, I visited Jersey in 19, early 1978. Funnily enough, on the eve of Jerry's departure for India for the first time since he had been born there, this is 1978, so he was about he was 53 at the, at the time. I mean, sorry, it was 53 years later. And, um, and that was, that's again another part of the story. I'm going to tell you a little bit later. I'm jumping ahead of myself. But that's how, how we met um, and how I then came to Jersey. Um, and, and we decided to get married and then he had to go on this trip to India. And uh, I had to go back to America. But it all sort of worked out in the end. And we were literally married. Oh, I don't know, 15 months later, I think it, things took a little while. But. Let's get into that story of Jerry coming to India in 1978. What, uh, did you come with him or did he come alone? No, no, that, that was the problem. We had just decided to get married, but he had already did, uh, planned this trip to India and I had to go back and finish my dissertation. So we had to separate at that point. And it was just kind of ironic that it was that he was going to India at that time. But what he was doing was, he had um, so sort of seventy eight back about in the early seventies, nineteen seventy, I think it was. He had heard about the rediscovery of the smallest pig in the world, called the pygmy hog, which comes from Assam. Mm -hmm. And because of his India connections, his love of India, he was very concerned at the low numbers. It was rediscovered, thought to be extinct, but rediscovered very low numbers in Manas National Park. And he was concerned that uh, it was you know, very threatened and concerned for his long-term safety. So he determined that he would wanted to do something about it. And that was to Jerry's uh, modus operandi, if you like, at that time was to set up breeding programs and bring animals to, back to his zoo in Jersey for breeding. I'll have to tell you about the zoo story in a, in a minute, how the zoo came to be set up. But let's just go on with this for a minute. And that is it. So he was going out to India to visit the place where the pygmy hog was rediscovered. It was on a tea plantation in, in Assam. And to talk to um, the people there, the authorities, about doing a recovery, a spe what we call a species recovery program for the, the species and to start a breeding program, et cetera, et cetera. So, and he also certainly wanted to go back to his, his roots and see India and he hadn't, it, you know, it hadn't been back before. So he just had a fantastic time. I would get letters from him from, from India. He saw the pygmy hog and, and got that all sort of rolling. And uh, he, he, we, he wanted to, as I say, to bring the uh, specimens back for breeding in Jersey, but because Jersey, Jersey Island, you know, it's famous for the Jersey cow, the Jersey dairy products, milk, and, and uh, um, the authorities in Jersey would not allow cloven hoofed animals like pigs or goats or anything to come into Jersey for fear you know, of, of some sort of disease, that kind of thing. But they said they would allow if the animals if animals could be captive bred somewhere, like at a European zoo, they would allow second generation to come to Jersey. So that was Jerry's plan. So he, he uh, went there with a view to having animals brought to uh, Zurich Zoo, which we, a good friend of his ran Zurich Zoo. And, and so some animals from the tea plantation, which were in captivity already, the tea plantation, uh, were taken to Zurich and they did start to breed and Jerry was overjoyed, of course, but disaster struck and the whole, they all died. Uh, I can't really quite remember, this is for a long time, I can't quite remember why. Um, but so that sort of put, a, put an end to the idea of breeding pygmy hog back in Jersey. Because Jerry always said where animals should be bred are in their countries, it's in their country of origin. And that's where the people, the, the climate's right, the food, right, the people would have the expertise if they've studied it. And so that really is what kind of led to our setting up a breeding center in Guwahati. Uh, and uh, so the pygmy hog, called officially pygmy hog conservation program is based, it's centered around the um, breeding station at Guwahati. And it's just, it's been fantastic run by just uh, some of our best friends, um, Indians, obviously, 
and uh, it's just been wildly successful. And I'll go into that in a little while. Yeah. So uh, let's talk about zoos. Jerry's uh, known perhaps for setting the modern vision for a zoo, like zoos before Gerald Darrell came on the scene where these very antiquated iron bar um, cages, which look more like prisons, weren't really uh, great for animals or for people. And he really changed that whole dynamic of, and even changed the purpose of what a zoo meant. Mm -hmm. He made it a mm -hmm. conservation tool, like we were talking about, you know, breeding them in captivity when the species was having a hard time in the wild. So tell us a little bit, how do you think, uh, do you know how he came up with that vision? It was just so <laughs> radical, it seemed, for the moment. Jerry, Jerry, you're absolutely right. Jerry was truly a pioneer in uh, zoos and conservation, and particularly because it happened all so long ago. What happened was, let me just back up a little bit and, and continue the story. From, from Corfu, the uh, Second World War intervened, and they all had to go back to, the, to England. And Jerry, um, as a, he was not old enough to, to go fight in the war, so he, he, uh, I think he got a job at a pet shop, then he taught horseback riding to American soldiers in England. <laughs> Quite a bizarre way to spend the war, but anyway. After that, he worked at a pet shop in Bournemouth, and he actually taught the pet shop owner how to look after his, the small animals in the little vivarium and terrarium, uh, which is interesting. But when he was 21, he came into a little money from his father's estate, and he decided to do what he always wanted to do, which was to travel, to be with animals, to collect animals. And the best way to do this was to go and for the sustainable, sustainable way, so he thought for him was to go collect animals for zoos. That's how zoos back then out there uh, acquired their animals. This was in the late forties, mind you. Uh, so he used his little bit of money, set up an expedition to West Africa, uh, spent months and months in the bush, catching animals, looking after them, learning what they ate, how to keep them, etc. And then came back to the UK on um, shipboard and uh, sold his animals, that's the way they did it back then, to the zoos of the day. He then made a little bit of money from that and then invested that in the next expedition. I think he went to South America, secondly. So throughout the late 40s, early 50s, Jerry was doing these zoo expeditions, basically. But what he observed during that time was that the, there were pressures on wild animals. They were being hunted and exploited. Habitats were being destroyed. So he would return to places he'd been before and see the changes. And he knew that the wild animals were, were in trouble. And, but the worst thing was is that the zoos he brought them back to, they would say, um, oh dear boy, don't worry. It doesn't matter if they die uh, because there are plenty more where they came from. And there were not plenty more where they came from. And uh, as I say, Jerry was so meticulous when he was out on expedition of looking after his animals and knew how to feed them and, and care for them. But, but the zoos didn't in those days. They were hardly more than menageries. So quite often they would, would die. And they just said, oh, just go get us some more, plenty more. That was certainly, I would say, late 40s, early 50s. That was the beginning of his notions of what zoos should be and what they could be but he didn't see any of the zoos of his day turning into that. So he determined he would set up his own zoo. It was 19, by the way, he had written his, he wrote his famous book, My Family and Other Animals in 1956. It was published in 1956. So before the Jersey Zoo actually started. And it was in 56 that he was on a collecting trip to West Africa, but this time he was collecting for his own zoo. And he and his first wife, Jackie, brought back uh, a West African collection and they lodged it at his sister's house in Bournemouth, um, much to the dismay of the neighbors, of course. His sister was very happy with it. She loved animals, but the neighbors weren't so keen. Uh, Jerry said, oh, not, not to worry. Um, I'm gonna start my own zoo and pretty soon I'll be putting them you know, in, my, in my zoo. 
but he couldn't find a site because all the authorities in that part of the UK and probably everywhere um, said, no, no, we don't want a zoo. It sounds terrible. Or yes, let's have it, but you have to pay for everything. Um, so he was very, getting very frustrated. The animals, um, uh, you know, were outgrowing their cages and he had to play some with another zoo and this, that and the other. And his, it was his publisher and, and his wife, Jackie, said, well, why don't you try somewhere like the Channel Islands? The Channel Islands, this group of islands, Guernsey, uh, Jersey, etc. cetera, uh, this part of the, kind of part of the UK, down close to the, to, uh, the northern coast of France. So the climate was a bit better. Uh, Jerry's publisher said, uh, oh, and there's hardly any bureaucracy there at all now, which was true at that time. And, uh, and, and his publisher said he had a friend down there who would host Jerry and Jackie while they possibly found look for a site for their zoo. And so they got down to Jersey in the summer of 58. And the, the, the friend took them around the island, showed them different sites, different properties, uh, back to his house for lunch. And his house was this lovely manor house and 25 acres of beautiful countryside with ponds and streams and outbuildings. And Jerry looked around and said, this would be a perfect place for my zoo. <laughs> <laughs> and the man, the man was a little taken aback. He said, well, actually I'm, I'm thinking about down, you know, I'm going to move back to the UK and downsize a bit, um, but I will lease the property to you. And Jerry said, okay, this sounds great. And then the man said, well, we better check with the authorities in Jersey. So there was no bureaucracy in those days. You could get on the telephone and ring the Minister for Tourism or whatever it was, it was called at the time. And, uh, and they did that. And the man said, what a great idea. We'd love to have a zoo in Jersey. <laughs> That Jersey was in fact just starting its kind of tourism business um, at that time in the, in, the, in the late 50s and it really took off in the 60s. And so within 24 hours, Jerry had his zoo, had his site for his zoo, which was just, and he often calls things like that Durrell's luck, things that happened to him that just really things worked out when, he, when he'd been so frustrated over other things. Anyway, he, uh, so, the, so the Jersey Zoo, actually opened in March 1959. And Jerry was able, because he was running, it was his zoo, he was able to start running it on conservation principles. Now, mind you, it was very um, sort of chicken wire and packing crates and, you know, there just really wasn't very much much money. But, but he, he wanted a zoo open to the public so that that could generate funds to then improve the enclosures, to acquire animals, et cetera. And uh, by, in 1963, so four years later, he felt the time was right to turn it into a charity, that is a not-for-profit. He himself had put all his, um, well, he put lots of his own money in to make, make the zoo run and make it happen. And every, every uh, winter when there were no tourists, you know, the zoo had to, to stay open. So Jerry would pay for, to stay open. But four years later, there was a, he had a good following uh, in his books and he then appealed to his, his uh, the people who'd enjoyed his books to join what was then called the Jersey Wildlife Preservation Trust. And it was a conservation organization that would run the zoo on conservation principles. Uh, he chose the, the extinct dodo for the symbol, you know, the dodo from the island of Mauritius that uh, became extinct within a hundred years of its discovery by Europeans uh, because of, of, of hunting and releasing of pigs and dogs and cats and things on the island. And Jerry chose an extinct animal as a, as a symbol to say, really more to sort of illustrate the vulnerability of nature, the fragility of nature, and then to tell the world, I'm not gonna let this happen on my watch. We are, we, our mission is to save species from extinction. And that's been our mission ever since, 60 years on, and we're, we're actually going strong. So, so Jerry's, by setting up his zoo and running on conservation principles, he was setting an example to the other zoos of the world. He also wrote a number of books about the evolution of his zoo and, and how it was devoted to, to uh, conservation. You know, the animals always came first, then his keepers and his staff, and then the public came, came third in terms of, of importance. 
Um, so he looked after his animals first, and we were very successful. A number of breeding, early breeding successes, um, you know, started winning awards in the sort of zoo business, um, and just went from strength to strength. We, we were lucky enough, as I said, to have that big influx of tour tourism into Jersey in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, and that's really what allowed us to develop and expand, because Jerry had vast ideas for his for his zoo. It wasn't just, I mean, it was never just a zoo, but he wanted it to be a center of learning. So we set up what is now called Durrell Conservation Academy. And we've had thousands of students from all over the world come to us and study with our animals, with our staff, um, then go back to their own countries and do conservation, whether it's setting up breeding centers or, so for example, the Pygmy Hog Center in India, in Assam is run by, um, Jersey graduates, Jersey Academy, Durrell Academy graduates. Um, so that, was a, that was another dream of his, again, quite different from what most zoos are, are all about. And uh, other, another thing he did was to, to start doing field work, field studies very early on. So the zoo promoted and supported work in, in the wild, in the animals' natural habitats, to, to study them and try to understand them and to see what the conservation needs were bring animals back um, for breeding in Jersey if they couldn't be bred in the country of origin. So all in all, Jersey Zoo became kind of what I would like to think of as a, a very multifaceted organization. We have very many sides. It's not just animals and cages that people pay their money to come and gawp at at all. It's just, it's way, way beyond that. And we've now even, go, go ahead. I was just thinking that uh, more zoos now are focused more on displaying and breeding charismatic species because that's what the public wants to see. But a lot of an species that need this kind of boost from conservation are not so glamorous. They are, you know, they could be invertebrates that, you know, public doesn't mm -hmm. want to see. So do you think that that kind of model can be uh, adopted by zoos who are watching? I mean, it is enormously expensive to run a zoo. So the managers are watching what people want, but should catering to the needs of the public, how do you balance it with the needs of endangered species? <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a very good question. But again, Jerry was such a pioneer in the sense that he was the champion of all animals, he would say. And he said, you know, even the, they call the little brown jobs uh, needed help. You know, the ones that were not, that were small, not very colorful, not very box office to use yeah. the sort of zoo term. And he said, you know, of course, the big animals need help, but so also to all the small animals. So, to this day, we, the staff at uh, Jersey Zoo, call the small animals, the LBJs, the little brown chogs. <laughs> and we're very well known for being champions of the little brown chog. Now, I know exactly what you mean. You know, the zoo managers have got to look to bringing people in. And indeed, we have got some large charismatic animals, like our gorillas, for example. We've had gorillas since the very beginning of Jersey Zoo. We've got uh, orangutans and spectacled bear, our Andean bears, they call from South America. But those are the the biggest animals that we have. So we we do you know, deliberately limited ourselves so that we can get people in because they want to come and see the baby gorilla, you know, admittedly. I do too. Everybody loves the baby gorilla. Um, but again, we do conservation work for those species as well. They're not there simply as display. We've got a number of students from Africa come to study gorillas with us, go back, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but what the rest of the collection is really you know, much smaller, many smaller species, more um, uh, not ones that zoos in particular would like to have. But you know, anything can anything can tell a story, and that I think is the is the trick to getting people to come to your zoo to look at less glamorous animals, because every virtually every species has got a fascinating story to tell. And, and if people just you know, get the people there and, and give them time to reflect and think about it and learn about the animals and learn the story, I, the people are just fascinated. 
I think the one thing that really struck me about Jersey Zoo was when I visited ages ago, 90, late 90s, I saw the uh, Richard Gibson was one of your curators and he had this little terrarium with tiny little snails. They must be called patula snails. Pat patula snails, yeah. yeah. He said that's a third of the world's population right there. And in this yeah. tiny little aquarium, yeah. and I, had, I don't recall ever seeing snails in a zoo exhibit ever. And that really <laughs> struck me as, you know, yeah. it, this is pretty amazing that a zoo yeah. is focused yeah. on, yeah. it yeah. wasn't on display, but it was behind the scenes. And yeah. what was on display seemed to be funding this whole conservation effort yeah. behind the yeah. scenes. Yeah. That's just, but a whole lot of zoos don't, okay, forget even doing that. They don't even display their animals properly, even in this yeah. present day and age. Yeah. So do you think we need to reorient the role of zoos? Do we, like the bar Jersey Zoo has set is so high. Mm. Is it, should, should everyone aspire for that? Or should we say it's okay to just display animals well so the animals are happy and communicate the conservation needs of just those species? Maybe not go into this, uh, mm -hmm. conservation behind the scenes or in situ in the countries of origin of those species what do you think I think you I think yes we've set the bar very high but you know there are stages to, to bars uh, and one you certainly just mentioned is to always animal welfare is paramount you have brought these you deprive these animals of their liberty you they you owe it to them to give them as happy a life as possible, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And that, that is possible within the means of, of zoos. Otherwise they should not, should not operate. So at least start with that and at the same time communicate properly. Have good signage or have your keeper staff talk to people or, you know, so, or have newsletters, but really work hard on that. And that can be done. But, you know, you said, and maybe they don't have the wherewithal to do breeding programs. Well, you know, the cost of the Partula snail breeding program was just, was hardly anything. So, you know, zoos can participate. And this is the other, this is the operative phrase is participate. If zoos are cooperating with each other, that is where the power is. That's the power of breeding programs. You can't just have a breeding program in isolation because you've got to, to have enough specimens to um, maintain good genetic quality. To do that, you've got to have different populations. Therefore, they've got to work, be in different zoos. You've got to exchange animals. And that's what zoos are doing now. I mean, back in Jerry's day when, when he started, it was all pretty poor. But as I say, he was such a pioneer and zoos have have come by leaps and bounds since those, those times. Now, you're right in India, I think there's a lot of room for improvement. As I say, I was there for two years ago, but you know, I don't like to come in as a foreigner and criticize, but you know, for everybody, there's always room for improvement. But we've had so many um, Indian students through our academy, I mean, a couple of hundred at least, and it was wonderful to, to go around the country and see a lot of our former students. And they themselves are in, jobs or in zoos or whatever, where they are trying to make a difference and to put into practice really good conservation principles that, that Jerry himself um, pioneered so long ago. So it's a slow, very slow process. And I very much agree if zoos are incapable of or unwilling to change or attend to the welfare of their animals in, in particular, and at least think about conservation seriously, then you know, I think they should be, should be closed out. I, I don't think there's any value in people coming and staring at wild animals, learning nothing about them um, at all. So anyway, that's my, my opinion. <laughs> the other problem also that I foresee, or I'm seeing already, is that when a species becomes um, easy to breed in captivity, the wildlife managers seem to forget that they need to protect the wild. Like in the case of uh, Gariel, 
crocodiles, for instance, in India. We've spent so many years breeding them in captivity, and they are very, very simple to breed. But their mm -hmm. wild habitat has not, uh, the protection of their wild habitat hasn't kept, been kept up. So mm -hmm. what happens, like you don't have, you breed all these animals in captivity, but there's nowhere to put them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And doesn't it create this false security then, the ability to captive breed animals that, you know, they will be there forever. It, it's, it creates this sense of we won't lose the species, but we are losing the habitat. So then how mm -hmm. does it matter? Mm -hmm. Now, you're absolutely right. That is a really good question because a lot of people say oh, we've got plenty of them in captivity. They won't become extinct and therefore there's not so much pressure to save their wild habitat. Well, that is just completely false. Um, it behoves the zoos who are breeding them, who are deriving benefit from breeding them, let's say, because they're on display or whatever, uh, to tend to the needs of the species in the wild. I mean, after all, we have, as I said before, deprived them of their liberty. We have, if we owe it to them, the species, to try to protect and save uh, and nurture their wild places so that they can persist in the wild. You know, you say, people will say, oh, well, it's in a zoo, it's not extinct. Well, you know, zoos per se do not, breeding programs, breeding in zoos is not being saved from extinction. Save a species saved is a wild species, the species in its wild habitat behaving naturally and being able to breed and, and continue with its generation. So, you know, I'm under no, no illusion that zoos themselves are the be all and end all. But, but what we do, and again, again, I think we can a model, is we have our many, many field programs. So, you know, we, we spend almost as much of our revenues, if you, if you like and our fundraising income in the wild as we do on the zoo in Jersey. Now, most zoos don't do that, I, I realize that, but they can aspire to it and just try to do it. Yeah. I urge yeah. them to. <laughs> I'm going to make break um, this part of the interview in a bit. Just one final question before we wrap up this episode on uh, zoos. Have you had any experience that drove home the value of zoos to you? Like, did someone make a comment or did someone else's experience drive that home to you in a very forceful way? Yeah, I'm just thinking when you say comment, we were working one of the earliest conservation programs we did was on the island of Mauritius for probably what was the rarest bird in the world. There were only four individuals left. This was a little Mauritius kestrel, little raptor. And this was back in the 70s. And uh, with only four left, that's pretty close to extinction. And there was only one breeding pair as well, so <laughs> even closer. And the conservationists of that day said to Jerry, we were all sort of getting interested in Mauritius, they said, oh, don't bother that species is a lost cause. Now saying the phrase lost cause to Gerald Durrell was like a rag to a bull. And he said, I'm not gonna give up. We will turn the species around. And uh, with one of the finest conservationists today, Carl Jones, who was just a young lad at the time, um, Carl started breeding them, this kestrel in Mauritius. And eventually, over the years, it has been turned around. So that was breeding. It wasn't a zoo per se, but it was a captive breeding center. Uh, and, and we have turned that species around. There are now hundreds flying free in, in Mauritius. Um, so yeah, that proved that absolutely, that's only one example of many I could cite, but proves to me the value of, of keeping wild animals in captivity for a short period of time, let's say, and in species terms to turn that species around and let it recover and be a wild species again. All right, let's take a break here and we'll come back for more. Okay. okay. <laughs> 